welcome to the Free Cities podcast. My name is Timothy Allen, and this is the official podcast of the Free Cities Foundation. Hello, and welcome to episode number 56 of the Free Cities podcast. Well, I hope you've had a good week. I've had a very enjoyable one. We're obviously building up to Christmas now and I live in a house full of children so you can imagine it's very exciting times. I've uh, also been re-reading a book that I've had in my library for quite a while now. Um, The other day I had to write a speech which was to be delivered at a 100th anniversary get-together of a photographic society and in that preparation I scoured the internet for other things that were also celebrating their 100th anniversary and guess what popped up in the results well the Weimar Republic hyperinflation that whole historical debacle happened back in 1923 a year when the Bavarian Prime Minister submitted a bill which proposed that gluttony be made a penal offence. They described a glutton as, in quotes, one who habitually devotes himself to pleasures of the table to such a degree that he might arouse discontent in view of the distressful condition of the population. No doubt the Bavarian Prime Minister would not have included himself in that definition or at least he would not have done it in view of the public, which is probably more likely, if I'm honest. Anyway, that book is called When Money Dies by Adam Ferguson, and it's an excellent account for that year, which, if you read it, you will no doubt notice, like me, some of the things that reflect a few of the experiences that you might be having in today's world. Of course... I'm not predicting an imminent hyperinflationary event, but I would like to read you the words of someone interviewed for the book, Erna von Pustau, whose father was a small Hamburg businessman. Quotes, We used to say, the dollar is going up, while in reality, the dollar remained stable, but our mark was falling. But you see, we could hardly say that our mark was falling, since in figures it was constantly going up. And so were the prices. And this was much more visible than the realisation that the value of our money was going down. It all seemed just madness and it made the people mad. End of quotes. Don't get mad, people. Get educated. Anyway, back to today's show. And it's an episode about amongst other things, the ills of the current monetary system, but also about architecture and free city planning. Martinus Hrobler is the chief architect at Tipolis, which I would describe as the most prominent company in the free city space at the forefront of planning, building and operating free city projects throughout the globe. Now, I loved talking to Martinus. Not least because he let me rant about one of my personal bugbears, which is modernist architecture. Well, modernist everything, probably, but um, in this case, architecture. Always good to get that off my chest whenever possible. I hope it doesn't bother you too much. Amongst other things, we also touch upon subjects such as urban design, progressivism, central planning, new urbanism, fiat in inverted commas, architecture, and I get Martinus's opinion on what he thinks of the way that the Emirates have evolved as a possible case study for urban planning in the future. Don't forget, you can contact me through the Free Cities Foundation's social media channels or our Telegram group, which I will put in a link in the show notes. And I'm especially interested in book recommendations, of course. So drop me a line at your earliest convenience, as they say. And failing that, in the meantime, just sit back, relax, 
and enjoy my conversation with Martinus Horobler. But in English, it just always Does ends up as Martin. Does anyone Martin? No. Oh, Rather, sure. my, my nickname is Tini, like T-I-E-N-I-E. Tini, okay. Yeah. Right, <laughs> Martinus. I'll call you Martinus. As a way to, to start, can you tell me a little bit about... So, this is what I understand. You're the chief architect at Tipolis. Yes. Correct, Okay. Tell me what you did before you came to Tipolis, because what I'm interested to find out is how you end up designing free cities. And, and, is, and is designing free cities important, or was it just designing cities that, that was important? Um, okay, so prior to coming on board with Tipolis, I, I studied architecture, professional architecture, and practiced um, in South Africa, um, on a different range of projects, from interior stuff to urban design um, projects. Also, globally, had a few projects, um, practiced in London for a number of years, um, and, and, and not with my own practice, and also opened up my own practice in in South Africa that I had for yeah decades, or decade. Decades, I was going to you don't look that yeah. old. <laughs> <laughs> um, and but in parallel to that i've always been um, libertarian minded and also found um how the especially through the mises institute how they you know clarified my position for me in a sense and it's also amazing another mises institute connection it's interesting (laughs) the mises institute have done a good job around the world of bringing people from all walks of life into this kind of lifestyle yes yeah no i believe so and um it was but it was also a network of um people in south africa that's also libertarian minded that um introduced me to that and but that was quite a while ago but i think from from an early age i you know i things just didn't make sense and for a lot of children it's so much easier to see that wait a minute this is just so much <laughs> Um, mythology layered on this and that for you know to try to validate this idea of a of a state and um, central planning and um, and also a lot of frustration throughout my career with um, architecture now you can see how it definitely influences the product of architecture in a super negative way state mandates you mean or just the state well over regulations and state mandates and and also that is no it doesn't come from anywhere it's just uh, exercise in power and um you know top top down control of course that um that leads to that um and then it was amazing to to connect with um the free cities movement um how did that happen um I can't remember exactly. I think through some people in South Africa, they told me about um, Titus Gable, and I contacted him and realized that um, you know there's a lot of a lot of potential now. If you have these ecologies of freedom, you can make amazing cities, and that is you know one of the <laughs> the best things you can do. And I I I'm, think you'll be hard pressed to do it somewhere else these days. Um, um, even existing amazing cities are being ruined by bla- you know bad um, policy and not being allowed to mature or being allowed to mature to not not protected or not protected. Um, there's a complete a complete. There's no price discovery in how we should you know live together. So yeah, it's it's really bad. Are any of your previous projects were they were they ever cities planning on that kind of a scale? Um, no, maybe conceptually or for projects or for thought experiments and um, also to design processes of how something can emerge on its own. Also, you know, studies into nature and um, the the patterns that emerge out of nature, um, stuff like that. So the, the largest physical stuff would have been if there's a... a estate development for example and they have um you know it's a, so it's a, a project on a larger scale but there's um sometimes it's all limited in terms of zoning so for example you can't it ends up being mainly residential stuff with maybe a little school year or um you know a kindergarten or some clubhouse or few shops and the golf course or stuff like that 
but um, not on the complexity level of um, of a city. So um, yeah, yeah. So no, so, no cities designed. <laughs> so so, so since you've come on board with Tipolis, then <clears throat> how are you? Where are you drawing your conclusions from as to how you know city, free cities should be designed and built? Then is it just talking to people? Is it big discussions? Or is it you? Is it you know? Well, well it's it's sort of the vocation. So you know, we've been trained in that in um, in architecture school and. Um, um, We've spoken about that, architecture school, though, and I think there's a lot yeah. of really bad ideas in architecture school as <laughs> there well. Is, there is. That, that's what I'm. That's what I'm kind of hinting at here, because I, yeah. I have had this conversation with you before, and um, it's one of my big bugbears at the moment is the modernist movement and how it hasn't had a massive impact on the way buildings were built. You know, it had, a, had an impact on all, all across the arts, music, everything. You know, and but buildings in particular, and, and it's a very widespread amongst what I would call, I don't know, the intellectual class in architecture. I think the, the average mm. person on the street knows what they like. Mm. And they don't like boxes and, and sh- you know, and weird shapes. And they mm. like, you know, classical house design or, or building design. Yet you have this kind of class of people who for whatever reason, and I'd quite like to go into your thoughts on why the modernist movement okay. well, even exists. <laughs> but, but it's, it's hard to make sense of all of this, and um, different people would interpret it in different ways. And even at university, we had um, different answers being given in revisionist history, etc. But um, I think um, there's a few lenses that can be interesting to look at it. So one of it can be, you know, to think, okay, well, it's one of the oldest things in the world, even back in biblical times, um, where the nation said, no, you know, they want a leader. And God told them, no, you don't need a leader. You've got me now. And, but they insisted on a leader. And, you know, there's, there's a, always, you know, a large part of human nature or a faction of humans that um, would like to be led by a, a certain elite. And, um, you know, so there's been a lot of ills, not just only in architecture and urban planning that led to that. The, um, but if we, if we take it to... Uh, um, maybe the the drive for um, central planning and also um, through history as we got to the nation states and you know they were led to maybe artificially grow because um, um, of various reasons one being you know usurping the money I was going to say <laughs> all yeah. of the all of those that Steal- enabled them stealing and pillaging yes, and, yeah. and printing money yeah. yes well, yeah. and but eventually that obviously found its... So you, you always have this strong pressure of an elite class that wants to um, tell other people how they should live. And that becomes a, a strong identity. Um, even in architecture school and in some other professions as well, you are taught in university when you walk in there, you are now the selected, you know, very selected few that should tell other people how to live and design society. And, you know, all of a sudden your identity becomes that, oh, wait a minute, I'm this very important... Uh, person and also that group <coughs> um, um, or that whole institution has this identity and it plays so into someone's ego that you know maybe I don't know I'm just guessing maybe that can be part of the problem and that people you know once you have that idea or identity about yourself or your profession or your um, or an institution then it's hard to distance yourself from it maybe so so there's always this um this this pressure of the elite class, I think, um, and also government protects the elite class because they they need them or the state, not um, and that definitely found its way through to institutions of um, universities. Once again, the role of what a university should be is not. <laughs> um, well, also, that, like, do, yeah, yeah, that doesn't answer is, the yeah. question: is why modernism? Like, okay. I mean, the elite class, I get, you know. But why did they pick modernism as their kind of big thing of the post-war era? You know? Yeah. So I think by then people were... Um, there was There's a lot of competing art movements and movements everywhere, but they were particularly... Um, um, well, well, two things. I think after the war, they were, during the war, positioned very um, against traditionalism and ar- traditional architects architecture for for various reasons and they wanted to escape the hegemony of it and um as the 
you know, and they also positioned themselves as crit critical in defeating um, Nazi, the past. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the past. And I think through that, that <clears throat> made them sort of the victors. And that's when a lot of those ideas were uh, transplanted to especially the U.S. universities and it proliferated there sort of unchallenged for, for, for a long time. Um, it, well, it was challenged, say, by modernism, uh, by postmodernism, I would say, but it's still on the same branch. Um, I would say modernism said, okay, we, we now have to remake society, and to remake it, we're going to reject tradition. We don't, we don't like it. So um, you, you, you see it again today with uh, progressivism, how they position themselves as not just removing the bad things out of the past, but in order for them to work with all the... Um, contradictions they have to reject tradition in its entirety i think modernism had the same problems because if you just once again like a child could easily see the contradictions in it but for them to sort of validate the <laughs> position that they took because of um, the identity being in it maybe they you know they have to reject tradition in in its entirety and especially beauty in both of those movements really beauty was one of the traditions that were certainly rejected the, the the classical version of beauty we see that now with progressivism i think as well yeah yeah definitely that's a, i think it's the same thing you know how yeah that's, which is that's a, which a, a strange thing to it's a strange thing to reject <laughs> i mean really when you think about it i mean yes. i can understand yes. let's kick out the old institutions but mm. but things like beauty mm. i mean you've got a you've got a very long historical um yep. reference point of people loving beauty yeah and and people still love beauty i mean nothing changed yeah of yeah. course so yeah so that's that goes back to um i'll, I'll speak about it, uh, about the price discovery that doesn't um you know it's not existing anymore but i think in a sense the um the postmodernists revolted a, a bit against that but they like i said they're on the same branch so the modernists said let's um let's redesign society after the war and it's not like Oh, after because of the war, that there was always pressure for people to design society, and this was a you know this they took um, that was a great opportunity for them to do so. So, but they said, okay, we're going to do it on reason. You know, we're going to build this new modern man, and while they do it, okay, what does you know what what does the modern the modern man need? So they designed this whole new idea of the modern man, which goes completely against human nature. That's um, but you have to because otherwise modern man's <laughs> who was the contradiction what was their definition yeah, so the modern man would have been you know a modern man he likes to work so many days and he needs he wants to live in an apartment block and this and that so and it was very utilitarian so they didn't really factor in maybe the fact that our deep pursuit for beauty human nature and how our identity should be in that and all the um i would also say all the maybe voluntary super organisms that um that makes up societies um they were very much on just a relationship with um you know the, the individual and the state for example which ironically leads to more individualism whereas um if you give individual freedom to someone the first thing they'll do is realize okay wait a minute i'm going to cooperate with people um and not just because um i can get further it's just it's in our human nature to do so in any way we have a uh, a whole um, mammal brain developed, <laughs> developed to to do that with a lot of rewards for doing that, and if you if you have society on these voluntary terms, um, you get very strong and resilient, um, adaptable super organisms of tennis club, church, neighbourhood, um, city economies, and and it's amazing. You know, I'm part of many super organisms, and you are part of many super organisms. Um, if you scale upwards and um, and those superorganisms re remain when I die. You know they remain like the termite mound, or and you can also go back in yourself. You know you're a superorganism of um, a partner from soul and everything from <laughs> a lot of um, organisms, etc. But then, then back to back to um, um, postmodernism. So they they said, okay, well this doesn't work for us. It's too ugly, and they don't go far enough. We maybe want to. I think their motivation might have been. Um, they want something that's more socialist, more radical. And they, they, you know, modernism in a sense disproved it um, in theory and in practice in a sense. And they just, you know, throw, <laughs> threw over the, the chessboard in a sense and said, okay, well, no, we're going to remake society, but we're going to not do it on the base of reason. We'll, we'll do it on the base of feelings. 
And I think in philosophy as well, you know, so if I, the whole idea of the F now, uh, you know, the subject of reality, and there's a lot of off truths that they exploit it and, um, you know, can easily deconstruct any position and, and you know, show, uh, uh, you know, the Foucault and Derrida's and, and all of those that brilliantly did that. Um, and so, so that's how I make sense of it. It's, um, it's still... It's still a very complicated thing, and I think, um, um, yeah, depending who you ask, they'll, they'll. But but that's an interesting lens for me for me to look at it. So, but for me, they're still on the same branch of saying, you know, we in this position to to redesign society, yes. which is obviously, <coughs> I suppose, a good thing, the redesigning of things. But <clears throat> I, have, I I tend to agree with you. One thing I, I think is apparent that often. When you intellectualize something, including architecture, obviously most people, well, a lot of people um, interact with architecture on, on quite a sort of emotional level. It's something, you know, and, and the more you intellectualize it, the more you, the more you sort of separate yourself from, from that thing. And um, I think that's a very common thing amongst um, edu- educated people is they like that. They like that fact that there's this kind of gap between them and normal people. And I think it can mean they can't see the wood for the trees. And I think modernism is a really good example mm. because um, when you see, well, when I see a brutalist building in the landscape, it's literally sociopathic. It's like, how could you do that if you had any connection with the real world, like why, why would you do that? And I understand it's like, you know, form follows function kind of thing and all this kind of stuff. But still, you know, when you, if you compare a, a beautiful, a beautiful yes. <laughs> um, handmade building yeah. with a, with a, with a sort of constructed box, it's, it's very obvious if you're a certain type of person to know, what the difference between the two of them is. There is another interesting um, re, uh, person who, who has a reason for why this has happened. You know Safety Namus, do you? The, the yes. Of the Bitcoin standard. Yep. And I'm not sure I agree with him on this, but his theory, of course, is that this kind of architecture has been decimated by the, the, the money monetary system we have. Uh, you know, it, I mean, in the word fiat mm. has become almost like an adjective now to describe crap crass yeah. and crap things and he would call it fiat architecture i don't know whether you what do you think about that notion that that the fiat the, the fiatization of the monetary system has meant that people are designing bad buildings because um of the pressures of the fiat money system to create cheap buildings that they can knock down and build again and knock down and build i don't know what do you yeah. think about it yeah I, I tend to agree with him um it's hard not to agree with him on anything he's a well, um, of yeah. all the things, I know he's a, he's a, a but but in that one thing, I yes, think most people who read the, the the Bitcoin Standard say amazing book. Not sure about the fiat, you know, fiat art and fiat <clears throat> architecture side of it. Well, I think it goes back to price discovery, and if you want real price discovery of what is the true cost of us of um, um, rejecting tradition or um, building a skyscraper, or instead of a this or a that, or um, there is no price discovery because the money is broken. So um, Bitcoin would have fixed it, <laughs> and or any private money for that for that matter. And if we look at if there were true price discovery, you will realize that wait a minute, people are willing to pay uh, a premium to live in beautiful places. And the utilitarian nature of modernism didn't take that into account. They think, oh, well, you'll be happy with a few a park and a this and a that and some artificialities. But I mean, that is actually evident now in, in the housing market in the UK, for example. You yes. pay more for an old house than you pay for a new house. Yes. Like a 500-year-old house costs more than a one-year-old house of the same shape and size. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it's obvious, you know, the market, even with the fiat system, still gets to express itself a little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah I don't think it's the only reason, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a major, major reason. Uh, reason. And, um, and, and it's also hard to say, if you, if you um, try to centrally plan a society and, uh, you know, urbanism and something that's beautiful, um, or try to put it in a graph or Excel spreadsheet, there's a lot of stuff that we don't even know that we don't know. 
um, about why we're attracted to certain things. And um, so you're definitely going to miss out on, on a lot of things. It's like creating a rhinoceros. I mean, you can't assemble it. It needs to it needs to grow from, and it comes from a process of many other <laughs> rhinoceros. Rye. Rye. It is rhinoceros, <laughs> but yes, I know what you're saying. Um, so, but that doesn't that doesn't stop the centralists of um, of trying because they, it, you know, it's a power play and they're not going to give it up. Um, and but also having not just bad mouthing architecture and. Um, in there's a lot of um, movements and counter movements in architecture schools um, that that definitely recognizes this. And I was lucky to be in one um, with some professors as well that said, you know, let's go go back and look at the processes of nature and you know be very process organized. Let's rather trust a, a sound process, not really knowing what it's going to spit out. But if the <clears throat> process is um, not born in sin, but it it is born in voluntarism and um, property rights, etc. Then you can fairly trust that um, there will be price discovery, and because you have to economize, you can't uh, you can't just make a city out of gold, um, <laughs> and that that'll be the best best outcome. So it won't be in utopia, but um, the price discovery and also the it would lead to that. And also a very important thing is that. Um, if you if you design the elites design it's a, you, you live in a world designed by the few um, and normally they design stuff for that they wouldn't even you know have to live in or projects for other people but if you if you look at the process of all traditional typologies it was that's still where tourists flock to it was um, it was the sort of incremental um, um, how can I say? Um, process. Yeah, 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 process and an incremental um, collaboration of a lot of individual or smaller builders that together did something. That doesn't mean it was just unplanned and haphazard, but they made plans and they, um, but with that comes a lot of quicker churn and quicker price discovery to um, <clears throat> what society have. And you have the hive mind and you, you tap into the power of the hive mind rather than, than just a centralist. Um, and you have this amazing feedback system, um, and the that's one of the. I think if you look at traditional cities, that's one of the things that you realise it's it's made up of a lot of smaller projects in in a sense. And How do you incorporate that into the designing of a free city then? Mm. Yeah, yeah, because, that's, yeah, but, well, yeah, yeah. Presumably, you're designing the whole thing, or is that not the case? You design the major things, and then you let the rest evolve. Yes, so. It, it depends on many things, but the short answer would be that's something that we realized very soon is, wait a minute, <laughs> this is going to look terrible if it's just designed by one person, even if it's the, you know, even if you, you are great. And some people might like it, some might not. Um, so I think a, a good plan would be to, to invite a lot of different um, architects and role players and owners of, you know, that will take up an opportunity there and to do that. I, ideally, you would like to say... Um, Listen, we a free city will have this ecologies of freedom where there would be price discovery, say, you know, no tax or zero tax, just a just a fee and um, only voluntary commitments, meaning that the regulation would be you know very lean, just really to be there what it, what it intended to do to you know protect um, life and property. Um, Not even planning <clears throat> planning restrictions. Um, no, no. So yeah, so. <laughs> That, that's one model, sorry, to say, but that's not what we're going to, going to do. So the one model would be to say, just let it go for, and eventually the best typology would emerge, which we believe it will be, but that might take 400 years right. of court cases and stuff being built and <laughs> brought down mm -hmm. again. So the idea is to say, well, how, how much of this can we get into the design process so that you don't have to do that? And to do, to do that, okay, we have to make certain decisions, but... Still, still saying okay. We're gonna we're gonna have a stab at it and build this typology or start rolling it out. And as we do, we get new information in, and you can have all kind of contingency plans and, and learn from it. And also to quickly as possible get a hive mind there that it's not just designed by by the few. And um, and through that um, have a have a better thing. So so to do to do that now to to guess what the Sorry, so, so you have this process that continually will self-adjust and put in new information that that um, is not possible really in 
in, in other jurisdictions. So um, a lot of um, movements like the New Urbanists, and they have wonderful ideas, but they, they, I think they lack the, the jurisdiction to do it in. So um, their stuff is, would be at danger of you know, just being frozen for, for a long time and that they don't have these um, You better things. explain what new urbanism is. That's a new term for me, new urbanism. Uh, what, what is new urbanism? Um, I, I would say, in, in short, it's a, it's a movement to say that um, um, we urbanism should be more traditional typologies, I, I would say, yeah. And, you know, they have, um, you know, the transect of how... Um, uh, not necessarily different zones and you know more mixed use and more walkable etc more, more human, human centric yes yeah, 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 okay. yeah. What so, about- so it, it would be you know copying uh, not copying just blindly copying but it would be more traditional looking the the problem just is um those cities were actually created by a process so you should copy the process not just the outcome mm. so they are in a sense copying the the outcome um, which is great but you know, time moves on and you need, um, context is different. So you can't just copy an outcome and put it somewhere else necessarily. But they're doing great work and they're making great, great strides forward. And I think, um, I don't think they married to the idea of, you know, just copying. They would like to copy the process, but it doesn't make sense because... It takes too you, long. No, no, and you're not allowed to. There's not a jurisdiction yet that you can do it. So I think, you know, free cities would, would give that jurisdiction for them and, you know, they're great ideas. Is so that, it, uh, sorry to butt in. Is that, yeah. when you say the process, are you talking about, you know, you know something like the, I don't know, the, the sewage system being there, the, the water system, the, the this, and then... Everything arising naturally around those things. There's a river here, so obviously you get the port there and the, the, this here and the, that there. And over a period of 300 years, a city emerges. Is that the process we're talking about? Um, yes, yeah. So that process would include, um, you know, the price discovery. So as you go along, you realize what your... And there might be different waves. Maybe your society is made up of more entrepreneurs and then later more families and then this and then the mine is shut down or then something is discovered. So it's a continual adaptation, long term and short term. There may be um, um, all, all kinds of things happening. And the, um, the, but that process might um, will also include, you know, the context um, of the port is here and the river is here, et cetera. And I think cities that really flourished were ones that um, was able to also get things going like division of labor. But to get division of labor um, going, you need to be as many connections, almost like a brain, as many connections as possible, as close as possible. Um, and I, I don't mean just, you know, um, Zoom connections that has a quality, but, you know, face to face connections, walk, walkable and f- to allow these super organisms of tennis club and neighborhood and all kinds of institutions um, um, to emerge and, and keep them healthy. Um, and I think that is that is what really drives a city or these super organisms where people, you know, you, you just um, sort of flow, flow through them. Um, then, but but maybe if we if we go back to to the process of um, um, how do you in, how instead, do you start? Yeah, how yeah, about yeah, that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so so back back to instead of um, just um, having no rules and let everyone fight it out in court on the very basic rules of property rights and um, voluntarism, um, we can say okay, we we think. Having this ecology of freedoms, we we would model. Um, we we try to say what it would have looked like. So two ways: one would be to try to model it. So you can you know use all kinds of inputs into a model, and but and um, and that can be very helpful. Um, but we we realize there is a lot of limitations in that. There's some soft things that that is quite hard, and. Um, so we prefer a process of looking at history that said the trial and error of history already modeled a lot of these things. And the nice thing about it is it, it modeled stuff that we can't measure or don't even know we should measure. Um, but once again, it doesn't mean going back to the past. It means sort of le- learning from that process. Obviously, it would have looked different if they had different technology um, like we have today or the prices are different then and now. Um, skill sets are different um so 
but then to to go back to that to that process to see what we learned then and then add um, how best we can model new things and and take a stab at it and say okay that starting to roll roll that out and then also having the the advantage of that the the process in a, in a free city would be would make for quick adaptation if something is wrong you know quick churn if something doesn't work it it can quickly be be changed um, and then also to try to do before you physically construct it to have as many of that in the design process so that you can um, sort of maybe gamify the future of it only to an extent probably um, by the interested parties and whoever would um, you know be the property owners or society and all the role players and see um, how you know how it, it maybe would have emerged to try to do that. So what is that process then um, from start to finish? How much, for example, do you enter into the initial plan of a free city according to the way you do it? What is it that you allocate? Do you have to zone it? Do you have to say this is going to be here, this is going to be here, or whatever? Obviously, the topography of the land and all that kind of stuff makes a yes. difference. But yeah. so, so in a sense, um, we we like the um, the continuation um, of people like Christopher Alexander um, working with patterns and also. Um, um, you know, to develop these patterns that can be adjusted to to the context, um, context of culture and changes, etc. So we'll, and it's a lot of overlays of these different patterns, being um, networks of um, mobility and car networks, and networks of communication, and um, you know, different scales of you know infrastructure, etc. You know, and having a, a city maybe as a series of squares instead of a you know a series of streets, and you know the order of those, and um, also also allowing for a lot of variety in a lot of um, different situations. Um, it, it won't be in um, one one situation everywhere, and through that you can see you know which gets more take up and 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 not, knowing that the stuff that we learned out of history and studying traditional typologies is that maybe something might be valued only later in a, in a city's um, evolution. You know, as it matures later, you'll pay a higher premium for maybe a park than you would have at the start. Um, so reserving that space is um, to, to the extent we can. And But the the very first, um, how, you, how you would roll it out or, or design might be um, to say maybe the um, it also depends on the the cash flow of the development is that the city operator itself would build these you can call them maybe lighthouse projects or they'll build a, a little town square um, that to attract people and in the past that was also the case where a prince or a benefactor would have built in cities a, a beautiful square to it to attract merchants or to attract um, a, a populace and you can maybe have a few of them and neighborhood starts forming around them and how you link them up can be either left to be random um, or just saying you need to at least build up to this line so that you define a street or this is the height limit or maybe maybe it's sort of self-limiting by the type of material or the the you know, there's the collective response to climate that people might have. So, um, which is nice because you need that variety. Otherwise, it looks um, quite stale. And people are, if you look at a lot of things, people are amazingly creative and they create beautiful things and they also want to create beautiful things. And so, and through time, this, um, I think beauty m might emerge by a lot of things that's presented, but also a lot of things that's rejected. Some of them would be rejected and maybe someone, if they build an ugly <coughs> ugly apartment or ugly office building, you know, it'll affect business and over time they'll change it and and um, this color kind of would come into fashion and that's out of fashion or these patterns, etc. Um, but there might also be a whole area where we are very happy for to have a neighborhood as a experiment that says in this neighborhood... Um, yeah, you can really do what you want. It's just the property rights. Um, as long as you don't have any emissions to your neighbor, that's fine. Or even if you do and he agrees to it, that's that's fine. There might be another one that has a limited, or you know, maybe it just says um, you're not allowed to generate any noise. Or so there can be be different ones. And as as time goes on, we can we can try to to see um, you know which would be popular and can can make profit actually. 
Well, <clears> that would be amazing if you had an area where the right was, <clears throat> the legislation was you have a property right, and that's it, end of. Because I know a load of people that would love to build whatever they wanted. Yes. Me, yeah. myself included. <clears throat> yeah. I would love to experiment yeah. a little with... But, yeah, you know. but we, we did, um, that's very interesting. So we did um, some sort of informal surveys of um, some people don't like it. Some people would like to know, um, I don't like, to, would like to look into a neighbor's building. I want to have certainty that the, the building I'm looking at or the neighborhood I'm walking around is all white or all this height or to a certain quality. Um, but other people don't like it. So I, I like the idea of um, having these competing things and let the market decide and well, I, I would imagine probably, because it's very much a personality type, you probably get a 50-50. There's people that love order and then people that love mm. chaos, isn't there? But, but also there'll be a filter of the people moving to a free city already. So um, I think it's a certain, um, already a type, a type of person that will move there. Maybe it's already a right? type of filter, but I, I don't know which Well, describe which that style. person then. Who do you think? Because I've I got my own opinion on that. Who, what kind of person do you think wants to live in a free city? Well, well no, all right. no, no, let's let say me, who, who, who would be the pioneers. I think everyone would live there, but who would be the first okay. 50 people? That might be an interesting... Let me reframe uh, the question, uh, rephrase it. What would the preferred building style of a pioneer be, according to you? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no idea. Well, think about but it. If I you mean, just look like, at this look weekend at the, at the conference, um, there's um, a lot of different personalities probably. But, but I, I do think that it, there might be some filter, but I haven't, I haven't exactly no, thought I'd of say, what it No, I would say that is, I mean, in your example of look at the conference. Yeah, look at the conference. Yeah. There's people who want to build tree houses and there's people who want to build, you know, tower blocks. Mm. You know, there's, there's a completely different group yeah, of people. Yeah, and yeah. I think the point is individualism so probably you would the pioneers are no different from the people that want to settle there although i think probably settlers would appreciate normal things i i don't know that that's a kind of generalization but if i think about for example when you're selling your house if you've got a really quirky house that's a very individualistic house that you built yourself it's much harder to sell than if you've got a bland house and you paint it magnolia on the inside. And, and look, that's a much easier house to sell, isn't it? So, so maybe the, the you know, the, the, once again, maybe there's a mi minority of people that like to build their own thing in a really quirky way. And then the majority are just like happy to, to see a roof. It's a large, I don't know, I think right. it's universally <clears throat> liked to see spacious rooms mm. i think isn't it but, but my reference is sort of fiat world where there is no price discovery so maybe maybe the answer is that people don't sell their houses there but what about <laughs> if you look back historically to times when yeah. there was the gold standard for example mm. the golden ages of of places what what kind of architecture was happening there well they had other problems as well so there was other things also limiting um um sort of price discovery of, of living together so and but that can be interesting if you look in the past there, there's certain patterns that independently of each other reappears you know across the globe such um, as one, one would be the walkability and the incrementalism of it and um the response to local climate and local materials and um then the need for public space and good public space um um that it's not only built just for individuals, but also for communities and institutions to, to flourish from. And I think that's sort of a, a pattern you see appearing all over again, independently of each other. And I think it shouldn't be ignored. I think there's a massive clue <laughs> into it and not, not like the modernists just to say, okay, well, you know, that contradicts some of our stuff, so we're going to reject it. Like we see with progressivism as well. Instead of making a new modern man, they're trying to make a new Davos man or progressive man. Or And progressive man would have these values. And um, if you don't, you'll be... <laughs> and they tend to be, be just the opposite of what is anyway. Yeah. <laughs> if something's... Yeah, it's the, it's the contrarian approach. Or it's the approach of there, isn't, there is no such thing as something now. 
It, everything is everything is open for question. Everything is open for debate. One plus yeah. one doesn't yeah. even e- equal two anymore. Yeah. They, they need it's to do the, it because it, it short circuits the whole logic tree, so they have to reject it. Or, well, yeah. but and even, rejecting yeah. mathematics <laughs> is one of the hardest ones to wrap your head around because... No, you have to decolonize it, it for sure. <laughs> it, pr- it pretty much is the, one, of the, <laughs> one of the few um, things in life that is, is really provable. <laughs> one plus one is two. I don't know how you you don't get one plus one is two. Oh, anyway. as, I, yeah, as I understand, there is some debates around infinity. Should there be infinity in mathematics and some of the things it used? But it, but it's a language describing things. And um, but yeah, it's it's crazy to think that we're at that point where that even that when you analyze it though, it's it's it 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 seems to be quite obviously about power mm-hmm. because. In a society where <clears throat> you feel disempowered, one of your attack vectors is to undermine the fabric of society. So if you and me are discussing something that we both agree with, or is it something that's universally agreed? If someone comes into our conversation and says, actually, that universal agreement, that doesn't exist. That knocks us a bit off center. And we're like, well, wait a minute, hold mm-hmm. on. So, so we're, we, at that moment, we're like, we have no, our, our ideas have no power over this person, even though they're universally accepted, you know. And I think that's where a lot of this stuff stems from. And you, you could look at that in, in terms of, I don't know, the, the gender stuff that's going on now. People demanding that they be referred to as mm-hmm. something. That's a power game, isn't it? It's like, hello... Normally, yes. I'd say hi yeah. to someone. Now it's like hello, and the next thing I'd say is, "You need to call me this." You know, like yes. I'm yeah. asserting myself yeah. right from the word go, even yes. though yeah. no one cares, yeah. really. And and but, you know, but but I think the irony is if you know if we had a friend and they they asked to be called like that, people would say, "Yeah, hey, sure, we don't care." But the whole idea that it's it's being their situation is being exploited by the power structures to. Um, you know, to be a little wedge to to sneak in more more powers, and as you said, the the goal is the power structures. They don't care about that individual whatsoever. They just mm-hmm. use it as a as a as a means to gain more power and say, well, in order to prevent this, um, you know, it's just a classic demagogue. So it's uh, <clears throat> and it's actually a shame that those communities aren't being exploited for this, and they fall for it hook, line, and sink, and they play into the game, and they. Um, I think uh, to their own, yeah, it's very, yeah, it's not a not a good situation. Well, like, but like you said earlier, you know, <clears throat> the modernist movement, which is all part of this same ideology, I think, came after the war, and you could argue, or, or gained traction after the war. I think it's been around for yeah, yeah. a, a long time. Yeah, let's call it that. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and there's that's an obvious rejection of well look we've just had world wars something must be going wrong with the way we've been doing things i could quite easily see myself saying well look we need to reject all that because it's ended up in world war Mm. one and two um but but it's it's it is a strange phenomenon to behold now because it 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 really i sometimes feel like um, it's the emperor's new. The emperor's got no clothes. It literally is that thing. Mm-hmm. You're looking at something. It's going. What? What's going on? You know. What is going on? Where? Where? It, where where's the? Where's the pragmatism mm. yeah. in, in all yeah. this? Just the normal, just streetwise pragmatism. Mm. You know, where's it gone? Same in architecture. Why are people creating these really bizarre <laughs> things yeah. that don't? Uh, th- they're building. They're building things that for humans that don't take humans into account in many ways (laughs) yeah definitely definitely there's no um but and there's going to be a blowback against it and the pendulum is going to swing the other way but it's still it's still the same problem um someone else decides elite decides for the rest of the society how they must live um so the pendulum might might swing the other way and it's going to be the same problem on the other side again so that's not the answer the answer is to build alternatives um create networks between these alternatives and and um forcing out those those power structures and that's very much what um um free cities movement is all is all about and there's um also on an institutional level there's some people in south africa doing um uh, sorry i mentioned south africa (laughs) that's where where i'm from where um you know, creating these civic societies and parallel institutions to government and where they can't, where they fail, um, 
the, these institutions are moving into that gap and um, doing great work. And um, so, but the same will be for all of these things. I think the answer to most of these things would be, in a sense, property rights and um, and voluntarism. Voluntarism meaning not just I'm voluntarily going to do whatever the hell I want. Meaning it's more meaning voluntary commitments. So I voluntarily commit myself to the tennis club and clean, cleaning the, I don't know, club after we play or whatever. And um, But it's great now that there can be a physical space um, because until now these were all you know, sort of in, in the abstract. And people have been doing a lot of work, good work with institutions, but um, giving a physical space um, has a great advantage. What's your own personal take then on what would be the optimum um, use of a centralised authority in planning cities, for example, or new new jurisdictions? Um, well, I do think you'd need a lot of coordination. You can save yourself a lot of um, um, money, but that should be that structure should be voluntary. Um, it might also be if you, you know, you can decentralise. Maybe instead of having a national regulations or national zoning or national um, people designing um, society in a sense you can do it move down to a city scale or move down to a town scale or you know but we are very comfortable to take it all the way down to the individual I think the further you go the better but even if you go just to a, a smaller decentralized entity like a neighborhood or a quarter or a, a little town that's already a, a, a massive victory and if you have the situation where someone can, if they don't like it, just move to the next town, I think that process alone would um, would lead to more price discovery much quicker so that people can realize, okay, there's actual consequences for this. We're losing our customers if we um, you know, don't have good quality services or it's too expensive or, or whatever the case might be. But if you take that even further and you take it to a neighborhood level or a... Um, that that process of discovery would just be much much quicker, and but we are very comfortable to take it all the way to the individual as well. And there might be certain zones that we you know would do that, and the individuals' rights. You know, then you have the situation where it is, you know, the idea of only the only regulation is the property rights and the voluntary commitments. I think that would be the fun part of town. Yes, yeah, most certainly. <laughs> what about the? Um... And sorry, ironically, there might be even more rules in such a situation. They, they just voluntarily agreed upon. So there might be quickly a situation that people say, um, I don't like this, I'm going to um, outbid your activities there by you know, buying the property or paying you not to do it or, or maybe form a coalition with um, other people in the community to say, you know, demolish your house and return it to a river or or whatever. Um, and with through that process, there might be a lot of things um, affected onto the, the title deed or in that contract that says, um, well, with this new situation, you're not allowed to this, that and the other. But everyone would be happy because it is um, voluntary. And if the situation change, you know, you can outbid it again. So... Um, so, and if someone don't want the situation to be changed, they would just reject the amount of money that's been given to them. So, did you yourself at Tipolis um, s- sort of land upon a particular style of building that you felt was applicable here? Mm-hmm. So, so as we went through this um, process, we realized even with the um, process of trying to model what something might look, um, apart from just looking at traditional stuff, we realized, well, that typology would be more traditional in any way. Um, so that's more sp- speaking on an uh, urban um, level. But urbanism and architecture, you can't really separate it because from, from one side... Um, the, the urban landscape is this fabric woven of a certain material or, or, or type um, and it has a massive implication on, on everything. Um, so, But it's also dangerous for us, I think, to, to just say, okay, we decided now on this exact style to just randomly pick something in history and start implementing it. I think there needs to be, be good reasons for that. Um, 
So it, it would be, you know, distilling it down to what is the, the core fundamentals of why was this um, received so well. Um, but that, that is a difficult thing, thing to do. And I think um, that would be, it's almost like searching for a new architectural language. Um, do you just like take one off the rack and start doing that? Well, ironically, it'll be much better than <laughs> the crap we have today. But we can do much better than that. We can we can allow for a new architectural language to develop. There might be a lot of it. Might be um, take much more time than you think because it needs to be rejected by not the designers, but it needs to be presented and rejected um, by the public and the users and the individuals themselves. Um, so that process might might take some time, I think, and so I think the best would be to have these different zones and see what the take up is and and move forward. But having said that, there is amazing architects doing amazing work, um, and then the idea is also not for Tiplis just to design the whole city itself. It is to invite as many architects um, to do different buildings um, and um, you know have a, a collaborative design on them, which is yeah, which I, that's sort of a process. I mean, when you say the traditional styles, I'm thinking traditional wear as well, because, you know, Japanese tradition and, yes, and yeah, yeah. You know, Roman yeah, tradition yeah, yeah. and, uh, you know, Icelandic tradition. Yeah, well, the, the better word would be the vernacular. And some people have, you know, vernacular one, two and the third vernacular of different um, um, countries. And it, it can also be to go and investigate on uh, on wherever the project might be. What is the what is the historical vernacular there and what was the reasons for that? Um, um, you know, the material, the climate, the culture, and then draw from that. Um, and because, of course, one of the things would be that the, I think, especially at the start, the, um, the most um, inhabitants or customers <laughs> would be local. And I think they, yeah, so it is, rooted in their in their culture so a lot of these things would be transplants in a sense once, once again you can't just create this living organism on its own how do you create a rhinoceros um you can't just you know do a little frankenstein job and you know, it's not going to work what do you think about what's your personal opinion not should i say on the way dubai's evolved what do you think or, or, or the middle east in general because i've got mixed feelings about what's going on there because you see a lot of mm-hmm. foreign architects creating rather soulless constructions there because mm-hmm. obviously that's the middle east it's not yeah paris or okay. it's not yeah. this and what's your opinion on it um yeah i do find it find it harsh it's um, just to start off with the climate is harsh so you it tends to be more you inside a building um you go in and out so there's there's, there's not really a public domain um well, the climate might not be an excuse. If you look at the old, you know, the very old um, um, neighbourhoods in Dubai, they they actually, you know, much much better looking and people, they were. Yeah, there was a, a public domain, and through a lot of passive people lived in the deserts for, um, with and they sort of mastered the climate in a sense by a lot of very novel novel ideas and trial and error um, ideas over over time, and yeah, but obviously I, I it's a uh, it's. It's sort of interesting from an abstract way, um, almost like New York would be. It's very impressive from a, um, just the scale of it and the, in an abstract way, it's obviously gorgeous. But to, when, as soon as you start interacting with it, it's very hard. It's not on a human scale necessarily. Um, there's not a lot of greenery. Um, your access to it is limited. Um, and... Yeah. Well, it, 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 a lot of experimentation has been going on there, though. You could argue it's one of the most interesting places architecturally in the world because many times they've said, you know, build me this or do this or, you know, yeah, I've spent yeah. a bit of time in a few of those, those places and some of them are strange. You, know, mm. you stumble across a whole reconstructed Venice mm. with nobody there. Yes. You yeah, know, yeah, well, that's you know, those yeah, kind yeah, of things, yeah, you know, and... Yeah. But but what is but I agree with you. You know when you when you go to the souks or, or the, the markets in in the Middle East, they're cool, they're they're, they're designed well. Mm. You walk around the streets and you don't feel hot. Um, and and they're but the problem is they went upwards, didn't they? Yeah. That's the, the the new invention of the twenty first century was to be, to be able to go really high in the sky, and that mm. suddenly is a bit. I mean, I, I, you may have an opinion on it. 
is is it even a a good idea like is that a good way to live you well know? that's once again it's not um it's not for me to say but we think that if there was price discovery if there was if you had to t- pay the true cost of a skyscraper you would have not being able to do it. I mean, it gets exponentially more expensive the, the further you get up. You know, you have to pump water and there's all kinds of technical issues and um, the sheer forces of the wind especially makes... Um, at some stage, you know, the, the, each story <laughs> that you add is just um, it's just really um, for the brand of the building or your company. So you, you pay a premium for that. And also in, in, in with fiat money, that's possible. With... Um, with um, um, sound money I don't think it would have happened it's also cyclical you wouldn't have had these um, um, wrong signals um, because of the, the the fiat money system you know to say that okay now that is enough savings in the system you can build skyscrapers no it would have been a true reflection to say no, wait a minute um, you should not not do it and also um, if you look at property rights if there's if you if you have to pay the true price of stealing someone's light, maybe, or how it influences um, other properties, it, it might also be problematic. The, this is one of the things, it's sort of, it's given to you. you. No one asks for it. It's sort of given to you, almost like modernism as well. Um, the, and it, it tends to be this, these objects next to each other, and you don't really, you can't really string a city together. How do you get from the one to the other one? You know, you go down, basement, get your car, and, and go around. It's very rarely that you can just, like, walk to another one um, and I think once again all of those soft um, human human needs for for beauty and connectivity to other humans has been neglected by by the um, yeah, the centralists I would say and, and the centralists when you add fiat money you get up my towers bigger than your tower is that what you're saying it's like the the, the the building upwards is a, is a symbol of power. It's not yeah, necessarily... It be, but, but sometimes it's fine to... Um, in in old days, it was also it's to make a statement. It, it's fine. I just think it's actually a case where you're, you're doing it with other people's money because of the broken money system, which is, I, I think, unfair. Is it true, traditionally, let me think about this, that when we built up high, mm-hmm. it was mainly religious? It was mainly like, wow, that's amazing... People weren't living high up in the sky, were they, in, in, no. in the past? I mean, we've built some impressive cathedrals with very tall spires, but there was never a thought of living there. There were always a, a way to impress. Yeah, well, well even today, if you, if you live in a skyscraper building, you're quite isolated from what's happening on the ground. Um, yeah, I, um, I, the thought uh, of living yeah. in a skyscraper. Really. <laughs> okay. Apart from the uh, view, it can be interesting, um, etc. But I think um, um, the... Maybe back to the church thing. Maybe that was also because it's other people's money. I'm not sure. But I think it was a bit more voluntary in certain periods and not voluntary in other periods. Cathedrals, um, though, do give you a sense of mm-hmm. awe. When you walk it into is. an impressive it cathedral, th- there is a sense of awe. Mm-hmm. And that sense of awe is important in the religious experience, I think. And and after, in a, in a way, after, you know, religious buildings, you've got banks that... Banks used to be really impressive as well. I don't know... Mm-hmm. If, they're, they're, they're not as impressive now, but they used to be really impressive buildings back in the day. If, yeah. you, if, if there was a, a town, the bank would always be the impressive one, wouldn't yeah. it? I, uh, think, uh, I think that might have been to, to show, when it was on a gold standard, it might have been, so I'm just sort of guessing here, but that um, I know banks also had to display their gold. You know, you can go and inspect the gold to make sure that they, hmm. there's not going to be a run on the bank, um, that they do indeed is not partaking into fractional reserve banking, that they can each note that they issue, they can actually back it up with gold. And I think maybe part of that was to show, listen, we have this sturdy building, um, we're not running it out of a little shack. Um, <laughs> I was thinking more modern than that, but that's an inter- I've never heard that before, that's quite interesting. That I, I, just, I was just thinking, I, I've watched um, some parts of Asia grow really rapidly. I've, I've been to many places before they were really built up. And I just noticed in a number of countries, the first big impressive buildings that appeared were banks, you know, in, in Southeast Asia and in Mongolia and places like that. And now it's not. Now it's it's other things. It's it's companies, it's this, it's that, you know. Yeah. That's interesting. I don't know the reason for that. It might be... It might not be true. It might be because they're the closest, <laughs> closest to the... Um, 
closest to the money printer. So um, yeah, maybe um, I'm not sure. And they did good business. I mean, um, they yeah they one of the sectors that um, artificially made way too much money. I think. What's your um, opinion on ornamentation in the free city world? Uh, do you mean on buildings or yes. statues and artworks? Well, I meant buildings, and, but now yeah. I'm thinking of statues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's that's great. But once again, it's um, it's not for us to decide. But you know, studying human nature, we can think that people do like them, and um, it's just a question of who decides what it, what it can be. But that can also be privatized. There's no reason why why it couldn't be. Maybe the and, and privatized doesn't always mean one owner. It means it can also mean the community itself, uh, you know, forms a company that owns the river or owns the park, and you know they vote like a company, and and um, you commit yourself to whatever the board says. Um, and there can can be a lot of different um, ones. There can be um, how you can even say something happens on in the park but you don't even you li live far away but you only you're part of a bidding system that contributes maybe you know a dollar a, a dollar a month to make sure that this activity doesn't happen or this one does happen in that bidding process to see um, um, which which statue or which activity you know should should be the best and but orna ornamentation um, um, can be great it, so, I'm just thinking of sort of a graphic. Normally, people prefer if there's ornamentation that it it can become haphazard. So it'll be maybe from the same material, um, um, because there's always this this interplay of chaos and uniformity. If you maybe look at a street with different buildings together, um, you know, some, we're sometimes on one. Some, sometimes <laughs> we're you know, on some, one now. I mean, the, the reason <laughs> I mentioned it is because the window over there. If you look out, the building opposite, not this one. You can't see it, it's around the corner there. <laughs> but that window, when you look out, the ornamentation on the building opposite us is literally Roman, um, it's a fresco, of, of a carved fresco that yeah. goes all the way along. And then next door, there's nothing. It's still ornament, it's still the ornamentation, but it's much more traditional. But this would really is, and I was just thinking about it, thinking, mm. well, yeah. that, in the modern era, that would be called a complete waste of money because... But every time, like we've got an American lady on the, from the foundation, it's her first time in Prague, and she's walking around with her mouth open going, this is amazing, this is amazing, as we do as well, yeah, you know. So yeah. it, we obviously appreciate all that and the higgledy-piggledy nature of it. It's not, we don't care that none of the buildings match each other in style, which a lot of them along here don't. Mm -hmm. I like that. I, oh, well, uh, they do have a lot of things in common, so there is a bit of order to it and rhythm, etc. And um, But also the interplay of a variety as well. So sometimes maybe you have, uh, you know, the buildings are all the same color, but they'll, different in, they'll be different in shape. But if the shapes are the same or the volumes are the same, then there might be more difference in texture or color, etc. Um, uh, um, this architect, uh, Nicholas um, Sanningaros, he's speaks a lot um, of that, of how that is um, almost sort of a, a, a fractal quality of, um, or a, 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 of, of pattern, how the, um, you'll, that ornament and that detail, even down to the materiality of the stone and the little holes you see in the stone or the, the texture you see on the wood and the little lines of how that it, it needs to be scaled up and in um, the building would that that pattern would repeat on a larger scale in in the building um so that is i think that's a very very important observation in in what most of the people would find beautiful and and attractive and that is that is something that is lost in in even contemporary architecture sometimes they do it artificially and um but you don't have that um, it's not part fractal of the complexity it's, yeah. it's yeah yeah um and yeah but it's it's gorgeous um but obviously you have to be careful that you don't look like a doesn't look like you in a i don't know very it can be very haphazard obviously but people people do like it and i i also like it i'm not sure i've ever heard of someone walking around the streets of prague going this place is ugly <laughs> like no one comes to prague and says where's the modernist sector i want to go and see the modernist <laughs> sector it's like you know this street's got a mm. beautiful tower at the end uh, of it and uh, all the buildings are are uh, incredible and you know that, that, that's a that's an interesting point so i would i wouldn't say we should, we would just go back in 
this is gorgeous. I think um, y if you just use this as um, to start off, you'll be, you know, successful al already. The but in searching for a new language, as we have new materials and new building um, um, methods, it it might be. Well, the whole idea is it, it's going to be cheaper to build in this new language, and this new language um, um, would typically be more organic. Um, the shape of it might have different attributes, um, not just the structure or the. It might also be as it does that it's ventilating something or it filters something. Um, the material, the shape would be. You'll only need a very thin, thin layer that can be much stronger than um, um, of, of, of a different material, and <clears throat> so that new language is is busy to um, to being explored and to evolve. But we don't know what that's going to be yet, so uh, we we have to wait. And but I think in the free city we will also start adopting that and have certain areas where you experiment with it. And and the interesting thing is. It's easy to do one building of it, but how do you create this this um, urban fabric of people doing it together so that it's um, that it becomes a language and not just a, a, a object standing alone um, that you can't in interact with, um, you know, to make to make a city, um, you know, to make a street or <clears throat> to share boundaries with. Um, but there, there has been, um, if you look at um, say traditional. Um, organic architecture <coughs> shapes in Africa. It, it's, so there has been languages like that. And it's been quite beautiful. I mean, when you look at <coughs> the area I live in, well, very close by us, is famous for timber frame buildings. They're black and white buildings, and they're they're of, they're beautiful to look at, but they're very functional because they they are a very rigid structure. It makes sense. They build the structure out of wood, and then you fill the gaps in between with mortar or whatever you want. And, mm -hmm. I, <clears throat> I I like personally, obviously, a really diverse bunch of buildings. I find it actually is a bit strange when you see all the same building. There's one village uh, town near us which has the most <clears throat> black and white buildings in the country. I think it is, and it's beautiful, but it's a bit weird as well. You walk into yeah, the town yeah, centre yeah, and it's like yeah. a everywhere you look are black and white buildings, and um, it's it, I get I would get the same feeling in a in a brutalist town square it's like they're all square buildings you know and personally i like to see a bunch of different things which mm -hmm. arguably the free cities model would give you that, that was another question i was going to ask you <clears throat> when you plan these things how much of the infrastructure and the kind of public buildings are you considering that you're going to lay down yourself um, maybe just before, on your previous point, it was it's almost like Italian food or, or just food in general. We like different things. We like a range of food. And um, um, Italian food was, they perfected food that was, um, you know, cheap and abundant. It wasn't, you know, it doesn't have to be the most expensive caviar to enjoy it. And I think the same, there's a parallel with that with the architectural language as well. Um, you know, the, the whole range. And, but it it has to... Stood the test of time, and you know, and have to evolve into something. The <clears throat> the infrastructure um, or public buildings as well. Though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So um, I think that depends on exactly the the situation, where um, how much funding there is to start with. Um, do you ideally you can you know start constructing large parts, but the idea is also to do it incrementally and organically so that you can get more more information in. And it's just better for cash flow and normally how developments m work. Um, so you'll you'll start building out maybe a marina um, with um, some shops and a, a, a bit of a public domain. Maybe there's a, from the marina a, a little boulevard to a, a town square and that might be the, the skeleton where you can start off with. And then, also the infrastructure needed needed for that. <clears throat> Infrastructure-wise, it's also, um, I think we're moving into an era where a lot of it can be more decentralized, um, which is great. So you might start off with, um, I don't know, say desalination or a borehole for water or collecting water, and then later you you have different system laid on on top of each other, and they. 
they, they don't need to be as central anymore, um, which is great. There's, um, it's more resilient and you know it's easier to, to roll out, especially at the start for cash flow. You don't have to have this uh, massive water infrastructure and wait you know, decades for it to, to fill up. Um, you can, in the interim, you can use that money much better. And the same goes for electricity and power and sewage and waste. Um, yeah. And presumably, what about the <clears throat> the city operators headquarters or something? I assume that's something you probably have to build yourself. Well, <laughs> yes, yeah, of course, you'll, you'll build so the building. So what style that, would you use then? <laughs> <laughs> How would you build it? What's it going to look like? I haven't made a decision on that yet. It, it'll, it will be context dependent. Um, um, and it, it might also be something that, that scale. And, and also the city operator might be very lean at, at the start. We sort of encourage as much as much um, peer-to-peer um, interaction. So, for example, the city operator might not... We'll have some services so that the city can work, but maybe some of... Let's look at waste, for example. Maybe the city operator's answer of what do we do with waste? Are we going to collect people's waste? Maybe it's... Um, Maybe the answer is um, no, we don't do much. Um, <clears throat> so then soon someone would realize, okay, we need we need to take our waste away, and we'll invite someone to start a company, and they can say, okay, well, you can't just dump your waste somewhere. You're going to have to pay damages because it's encroachments on someone's property. You can't just flush it in the river, uh, <laughs> and then you'll realize, okay, I have to pay to get my waste removed. Um, a business would take care of that and an entrepreneur would say, okay, well, I'll take your waste away. You'll make a deal with an, another property and maybe do a landfill or you'll ship it out to another country or um, have a waste to energy um, thing that you can do. And um, maybe he does a poor job and there's another company that realizes, okay, well, he deals with this, but I give me your the organic organic waste, I'll take it off for my farm, I, I'll even pay you for it or collect it for free. And soon you have this whole uh, market discovery um, impacting that. The, um, because it's not really something like waste, everything is a resource you know, to be used for, for something else. Um, the, um, so, so that's in a way that where, the, where some of the services can be, can be quite, quite lean. Um, <clears throat> but we will, of course... <laughs> Um, you don't want people just to move to a place and tell them, okay, <laughs> you're on Talk your to own. You. <laughs> Get <laughs> no, on with it. No, so there will definitely be a very soft landing for people um, coming in, you know, with waste and with um, power and water and safety and security and telecommunications and all the all the luxuries um, one expects from a, a, a modern world. Um, but the idea is to to do this in partner with other businesses so that they, to, as quickly as possible, introduce competition in, into all of that. Otherwise, you're just recreating a normal municipality where everything is subsidized and, you know, the quality suffers, there's no incentives um, and you miss out on the, uh, the, the quality and reductions in price that, that competition bring and also the innovation of that. So to, to get that going as quickly as possible. That might be done by... Um, Oh, there's various ways you can, get, you know, later sell some of the um, utilities to other people who have public auctions doing it, and also knowing that nothing stops a citizen from um, using another service. Mm. Yeah. Uh, final question, because I'm cognizant of time here. Um, I don't know whether you can talk about stuff like this, but is there are there any projects on the go that you can speak about about that are being designed um unfortunately we always feel very bad that we can't um say which locations because um it is it is unfortunately sometimes politically sensitive yeah and i know <laughs> but there there are certain certain regions and um we are in Negotiations with governments and, you know, more or less five in talks with more or less five governments at any given time and on a very serious level. And there's a, another list of, you know, 15 more or less where that's in different f- phases of, um, of maturity. And yeah, but there's, yeah, so, but let's just say there's been places where we already are, are designing, um, 
you know sort of the master pattern of what what things can can look like on it yes. and you'll hit when the, when you can you'll hear about them here first i'm sure yes <laughs> <laughs> well uh, martin this, thank you for coming in it's fascinating talking i'm glad that i have an ally in my hatred for modernism as well um, because um, it uh, it means a lot. <laughs> well, some of them are beautiful objects. You have some of these objects that are beautiful in modernism. Um, really, which ones? <laughs> <laughs> but it's just it's beautiful as an object. But you don't want to. You can't string a city together of that. You don't want them all over the place. It's it might be a standalone thing somewhere else, and some people like it, and some dislike it. But um, um, I'm not but even yeah. sure they're pretty <laughs> objects. I'll be perfectly honest. I like the. Um, I like. I don't, what's the word? I like the mistakes. I don't like straight no. lines. I like curvy lines. I even like just slightly unstraight lines. And, and you know, Bauhaus, Le Corbusier, these kind of <laughs> monstrosities. Um, you see them in London, you know, mm-hmm. in, in the centre of London, former beautiful areas which are knocked down and and in the but of the barbican's a classic example yes, it's, yes, it's yeah, a, yeah. and you know like i because i lived and worked in london for many years and you when you drive past the barbican you literally drive past it you, you don't <laughs> you don't become part of it whereas when you're driving down other streets in london you're you're in london and then you get to those kind of wide roads around the barbican and you mm. just don't have any interaction with it at all it's so obviously a bad design yeah yeah, yeah. Um, but well, well sometimes i'm enjoying them maybe just as an artifact out of history because we studied them it's um it's going to it's like modern art in a sense you oh you recognize that and yeah but you know, i don't you, know you modern it. art either. yeah no. <laughs> well, that's, well, that's a very is, great parallel to that yeah yeah modern art's yeah, the same yeah, it's, it's yeah. also <clears throat> pretty mm-hmm. trashy and a rejection yes. of beauty and all this kind of stuff yeah. the the thing that people do say though about you know like bauhaus architecture when you say, oh, you know, that's, I don't like it. People say, oh, but people, you know, like people always rejected the, to the, the style of the day and stuff. But I don't think that's true, is it? Yeah, I don't think in that case. I think that was something that was given to, to people, not, um, and, but people are not the same, obviously. A lot of people <clears throat> might like it and um, for historical reasons and as a counterculture, this and that. But um, I think if you try to, well, it goes into the question, is there something like objective beauty or is everything subjective? I think there might be something of like objective beauty. Of course, I'm undoubted. We've got thousands always, of years of history to show yeah, yeah. people have yes. literally sung, drawn, designed <laughs> with beauty in mind. But, but obviously there's still the spectrum and maybe, you know, who are we to say where the spectrum must start and end? But I'm, I think you I know like what I like. You sound like a postmodernist now. <laughs> Nothing's no, real. no, both modernism. <laughs> no, no, but that's the danger. I think they use that little half truth of saying there is a bit of a spectrum and really um, try to use that and to say, well, because of that, that means there is no truth. But I do believe there is an objective. Um, but it, I think there is a distribution um, um, of that. Um, I, I, well, <clears throat> but I think it's much narrower than they than they would make out. Mm. Well, especially in the case of real hard sixties you know modern modern design you know you see it all over cities around the world and it's very hard to look at a sort of tower block which and and inevitably as well i mean the barbican's an exception because it's right in the middle of london Mm -hmm. right in the middle of london but other than that most of these buildings are for sort of like poorer people aren't they your average kind of like modernist building was built for the masses. It wasn't mm-hmm. built for the elites. They built it for the masses. And I think it, it just shows because they, they didn't really, you know, they didn't really care. And I'm not even sure that, I mean, it really says a lot about what some people think about mm. people. Yeah, you should live in boxes piled on top of each other. I mean, that's basically what you're but saying, why, isn't but it? Why, <laughs> but why do a lot of people find the Barbican so fascinating and some people love it, even though... Because it's a monstrosity, I think. Do you, do well, think? because it is. It's, an, like, it's, it's like, for example, sometimes people design ultra-modern buildings and, and slap them right in the middle of nature, yeah. don't you? You see them in, yeah. on Instagram <laughs> yes. and they're so brutally placed 
that they're a, they're a, they're a curiosity. You look at them and go, oh my, they have absolutely no connection to the landscape. There's definitely at all. curiosity value to it, I think. Yes. Yeah. But the problem with I find with those kind of buildings, and it's the same with, like even on a micro scale, when people redesign their kitchen and they do it in a very modernist way, they don't age well. What natural looking buildings do is they get a patina. They get they get a used feel, which gets better with age. Whereas modern modernist buildings, because they have such sharp lines and clean colours and all this kind of stuff, as they get older, they look worse. <laughs> and they really do. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, you can look at a a, a six hundred year old Tudor or, or a Tudor building that's slightly crumbling down, and it yeah. still looks beautiful. Yeah. Whereas if you look at the Barbican, which is what happens to a lot of these sixties buildings, mm-hmm. is within twenty five years. They look horrendous. Mm. And, uh, you know, they don't inspire people to look after them as well because they're so brutal, mm. you know. Um, Modernists also suffered from the technical things of how to handle water with the new materials. And that that hasn't been thought out through, really. So they have a lot of sort of water damage and had to be closed. And flat, be yeah, flat roofs but, and so, things yeah, like that. So, I mean, so the... the so we, we spoke about modernism as a movement, but how do you feel about contemporary architecture? Um, it depends what you mean by that. Um, you know, people doing stuff in bamboo in a new shape or in... Um, well, look... I've, or in timber, you get amazing new timber buildings. Um, or here's that, my, that's, not, that's not necessarily in a traditional pattern, but... Um, my, my opinion on, on architecture is, will it last... 400, 500 years. That's kind of all I care about. And we've just, mm-hmm. we, we bought a 400-year-old house in the UK, an old farm, and we renovated it over eight years. And I also built extensions onto it. And the extensions I built on were hugely over-engineered. Thick walls, stone, you know, wooden frames made with very thick sort of like hard, hard you know. And that's my style of architecture. Is, is is it going to be here in 400 years? Because the, all the buildings we live in are, have been around for a very long time and they stood the test of time. And that's kind of all I care about, really. Uh, but I think there is, a, there is a design that goes along with buildings that last a long time. That's just a, a fact of nature, like for, you, you mm-hmm. mentioned um, water damage. Obviously, roofs in that shape are really good at stopping water damage happen. Flat yes, roofs, on yeah. the other hand, are a well, terrible idea yeah, in rainy yeah. places. Well, you know? well, normally if you see something in nature and something that um, stood the test of time, it normally has more than one function. Normally three or four things. You know, if you look at the roof, um, um, how it casts a shade and gives sunlight to the neighbor and it, it maybe makes a, a volume that you can use and that volume can also insulate, etc., etc. But um, back, back to your point of something to last, um, so, I don't know, I can't remember who it is, but that said... Um, if you if you want something to last, you don't make it um, um, functional. You make it beautiful. Oh well, I'd like to shake that man or woman's hand. I think um, I I would agree wholeheartedly because you want to care for it and look after it. Then yes. that would be my yeah, hundred percent. This is why you know <laughs> brutalist buildings are, are are not even designed to last fifty years probably because who wants to care for them? Unless they are like the Barbican, or there's a few places in West London that I know which are slap bang in that some yeah. of the most expensive neighbourhoods yeah. in London. So of course they're going to look after them, you know, because they're, they're maybe they're, there's just so much steel and concrete, you know, that you it's physically impossible to remove it. Like that building in Berlin where they had to build a, <laughs> a tower over a bunker. Well, Berlin's a good example it. because I used to live in Berlin as well. Yeah, and Berlin at one point was you know almost destroyed and. Um, in the streets that I lived in Prenzlauerberg, which all the buildings at one point were just bullet strewn. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, a large majority of them have been done up with traditional facades. But you do see the ones that, you know, you see blooded. And then all of a sudden there's like a a robot sort of structure (laughs) going tall, thin thing. And it it is jarring. But I think in in, in a way, in in Berlin, it kind of works because, you know, it shows you the diversity mm-hmm. of, of building styles and the chaos and the chaotic. Yeah, and it has a very particular history as well. Yes. But the problem you see I have with those with modern buildings, and I agree with safety in here, fiat buildings are using materials that aren't built to last. Mm-hmm. And and almost the part of the business model is knock them up fast, yes. build them quick, 
make some money and then if they need to be knocked down again i don't care yeah. that's not i'm a hard money person i'm yes. a, I, I think if i'm going to build a building which we have done i want it to be there in in 400 years and i'm going to do that and i feel happy sitting in my building mm-hmm. that i think will last 400 years and i hope that sentiment comes back and i hope it uh, in free cities it's there because i think currently we were talking about you know, what kind of people come to a free cities conference. Most people are of the opinion that hard money's, whatever that be, gold, mm-hmm. Bitcoin, mm-hmm. whatever, are, are, are a source of, are a form of money that inspires longevity and long-term thinking. And, and history would show that as well, that during periods of history when um, hard monies were used, mm-hmm. the, the, the kind of, the idea of printing money didn't exist therefore the idea of just whacking up things that didn't matter everything mattered more in those in those days you know what i mean it, it, and i hope that that that's a a sort of a, a phase we're entering back into and you know free cities will will hopefully be part of that well one of the common denominators of the people at the conference might be the time preference um <laughs> I think of, so. Of them, yeah, so that might be one. No, um, I think I think yeah. it is. I think it's a very unifying factor. Yeah. Because let's face it, if you're thinking of building a free city, in you're not really probably even thinking that it's going to happen in your lifetime. In many cases, you're you're planting the tree that someone else is going to have shade under, aren't, aren't you? Yeah. Um, unless you know, and and yeah. So we are. I mean, I think in general, yes. I, I think most people here do have low time preference. Um, I certainly do. Anyway, anyway, like, I'll stop going on now. I'm ranting. It's because it's late on a. Okay. It's 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 <laughs> late on a Friday, Saturday night, isn't it? We we have a dinner to go to as well, don't we? Anyway, um, Martinus, thanks for um, thanks for talking, and uh, I've really enjoyed this. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. Thanks so much. Very interesting. Mm-hmm.